Hey everyone, welcome back to Insider Guides Industry Webinars. I'm so excited to bring you this one here today. Today we've got uh, Professor David Lloyd, who is the, uh, the Vice Chancellor and President at the University of South Australia. Uh, so yeah, Rob and I will be diving deep and, and trying to unpack, uh, well, the future of online learning, uh, the future of campus-based learning, the future of international education in Australia, and lots more. So stick around. Hello, 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 and uh, welcome everybody. Uh, here we are. We can just wait for the participant count to, to get up there. Um, this is a, a really exciting webinar here today. Welcome to the 10th webinar uh, of the Insider Guides industry series. Um, you know, thank you again for tuning in each week. Uh, it's just a, it's a really lovely thing that, that, that you're doing and, and supporting the some sort of uh, proactive optimism and, 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 and positive optimism in the, uh, in, in the international education sector. My name is, is James Martin. I run Insider Guides uh, International Student Guides. We prepare, welcome and support international students across Australian cities. And uh, yeah, let's, let's get into it. Innovation and disruption. So innovation is a hot topic at the moment. And along with the other words such as disruption and the new normal, we start to question what it really means. And disruption sounds like an exciting word associated with new ideas and growth, but disruption can also be painful. And over the past few months, education has been at the mercy of huge shifts in the international student numbers, on-campus teaching, online learning, changing expectations from students, staff and parents and more. So how are the universities navigating the shifting landscape? Will the student experience be changed forever? Is this a permanent shift to a new normal of online learning? And what does that mean for students that want to study abroad for an Australian experience? To discuss this and more, I'd like to welcome back my co-host, Rob Lawrence. Rob is a well-known, he's well-known across the education sector. He's an internationally renowned researcher and strategist who possesses extensive credentials across all levels of education. Welcome, Rob. Well, thank you very much, James. Thank you. Thank you for the intro. And also like to uh, introduce today's guest speaker. Uh, we're very honored to have Professor David Lloyd. David Lloyd is the uh, Vice Chancellor and President of the University of South Australia. My old university, in fact, where I started Insider Guides. So that's very special for me. A Dublin born and educated chemist who specializes in computer aided drug design. Professor Lloyd has refocused institutional culture to position UniSA as Australia's university of enterprise and to shape its activities to better meet the challenges of the 21st century. Professor Lloyd currently sits on the board of Universities Australia, the peak body representing the university sector where he is the lead vice chancellor of for research and innovation. Professor David Lloyd, thanks for joining us today. Thanks James. Well, uh, again, uh, thank you so much for uh, everyone for joining us. The Q&A box is available uh, below at the bottom of your screen. If you have any questions throughout this webinar, please do feel free to, make, uh, to ask a question. I'll launch a poll soon. Uh, I've got a few questions I'd love to get your, uh, your insights into. And at the end of the webinar, you will be invited to, uh, to complete a short survey. And please, uh, Rob and I are always trying to improve these. And um, you know, this is, your, your feedback is, is much appreciated. All our webinars are recorded and available at, in, at insiderguides.com.au forward slash webinars and at our YouTube channel, which uh, Raf will send through in the chat. Well, let's get into it. Over to you, Rob. David, thank you so much for availing your time today. It's really appreciated. And um, uh, I'm personally very grateful to you as, and join James in that. Um, you, once, you may remember sending me a text once saying about disruption and that stuck with me. And, Really, the unprecedented level of disruption we've experienced has impacted every level of education in every way. The rapid trans transition to online delivery, responding to changing student expectations, the impact on researchers who are often forgotten, I think, and academics, the shifting goalposts make for an almost impossible scenario for any university to balance. And this disruption has obviously impacted the international student sector from the difficulties traveling, the lack of the direct student experience, and access to student health, affordability challenges, 
uh, the impacts on universities and institutions at all levels with zero virtually uh, mid-year intake, the transition to an unknown mode of learning, which is often against different uh, ways people have been raised, uh, the sense of isolation, the inability for our marketers and recruiters to actively engage in market. It's a long list. What learnings have you taken from this experience which may impact the future shape of the international education sector? And by that, I mean what we offer, how we work, how we promote. Um, well, Rob, um, first of all, I, I do remember sending you that text. And I think um, anybody who, who works for me or in an organization that I work in, they'll have a very low boredom threshold. So a bit of disruption every now and again is, is sometimes welcomed. And, uh, and, and we're, we're still working on that particular disruption a couple of years later. Um, I, in, in, in terms of like learnings from this experience, I think the number one learning for me as if you like the chief, chief executive of an organization which is engaged in international um, education and dealing with the international student centers, no matter how prepared you think you are for, uh, for a shock, you're not prepared. And, and the, all of the conversations about black swan events tend to be around the lines of, well, what would happen if, you know, if the market collapsed by 30% or 40% or 50%? Those things um, are normally treated as, as hypothetical um, uh, events. They're not, they're, you, they're, they're not necessarily always modeled out to, well, what exactly would you do if all of a sudden everything that you, 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 you recognize as being normal in terms of the provision of education gets flipped on its head? Or if you get a five minute heads up on the 2nd of February, that in five minutes time the national borders are going to close uh, to international arrivals from from china and you know that a vast uh, well not in our case not the majority but from a sectoral standpoint the majority of uh, chinese international students were still in china because they've been celebrating chinese new year at that time um, and we were unclear when they were going to come back and they had every expectation that they were going to continue in their education so what it's, it's taught me is that yeah, you know, while you can expect the unexpected, you have to react to the unexpected when it arrives. Um, and it also taught me that uh, it's incredibly important to have a robust institutional culture which is responsive and adaptive and solutions focused because it, it would be very easy to just kind of wring your hands and gnash your teeth and, 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 and start to wail at the, at the fact that well, oh, we're being disrupted for us. This was something which, which had to be responded to and to have um, a cohort of people in the international office, in the registry, in online learning education, great academic staff, great professional staff, who, who, who literally were in work on the Sunday after the border closed. So the border closed at 5 p.m. on a Saturday afternoon, and at 11 o'clock on Sunday morning, we were in trying to figure out what we were going to do to support students, how we were going to provide connectivity, how we'd negotiate firewall challenges, how we would put in place communications strategies, because at, at that time, and this was the beginning of a bigger crisis, we were dealing with a stranded cohort of international students from, from one country. It became more of an issue, as you say, as we work towards the second half and the intake, and, and, and it looks like there's a much bigger disruption to, to ongoing business. But we were dealing with a point in time challenge. Um, and we, we were of a view that we, we still actually didn't know who was in country and who was out, uh, how we were going to communicate to those that were out. And, and, and how long they were going to be outside for. So the, the, the number of unknowns was, was phenomenally large. And so we sat down um, on that Sunday morning and, and, and literally worked through how do we connect, who do we know, what are we going to ask, how do we make sure that they're not, um, the students are not, so, uh, they're already worried that they're not going to get back. So how do we make sure that they're not in, in, in heightened anxiety because where they think they're going to come to is not engaged with them. And, and engagement with that cohort became the number one priority. And it was really like, I, I, an old boss of mine used to talk about eating elephants one, one bite at a time, right? It was, we have an elephant, we're gonna eat it one bite at a time, we're gonna work our way through it, and the first cap off the rank is, find out how big the exposure is, and find out who we can talk to, and find out what we do with them next. Um, it also then, uh, as, as, as this uh, disruptive um, event started to cascade, it taught me that, institutional um, business continuity plans and institutional crisis management response plans are not geared for sustained crisis. They're geared for there's been a fire in building X or there's been an unfortunate security incident in, in, in FOIA Y. Um, 
they're not geared for everything that your business model being being disrupted on, on an ongoing basis where you have to change the way you do business in order just to do business and the cascade of, of, of restriction and, and, and imposition which flow, flowed to us from COVID and that when you enter crisis management mode um, suddenly you have to decide that you're no longer in a crisis and what you're doing is actually you're just managing a different set of business normality so we we have a we have a senior crisis management team in the organization we have a, a protocol for when it gets set up and um, we we established it i think it was we, we formally pushed the crisis button two days before the pandemic was declared uh, globally and we had a pandemic plan but we only kept that crisis team in business continuity continuity mode operating for uh five weeks of that time because after five weeks it was quite obvious that this is this is how we're managing the organization Wow. And we, we went back to, to, to regular management in just what's a sustained period of, of, of unusual business. Um, and I guess the learnings from that are that you can, you can think you're prepared and you can have a pandemic plan and you can have a business continuity plan. But the, the, when the rubber hits the road, it is in the doing, the reacting, and in the caliber and quality of your staff that allow you to respond. And disruption, the quantum of disruption is measured by impact. And our view was let's take every step we can to minimize the impact on staff, on students, to work in that safe, health environment, but also to make sure that we keep the connectivity and then keep a weather eye on, 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 on what was uh, an incredibly dynamic situation. Yeah, it did. Uh, it's, it's a situation that I think is still unfolding and it's causing a ripple effect across the sector. But what it is doing is also showing the, how, how volatile some of the business models are. Um, and I'd like to sort of jump forward a little bit because uh, last week we showed a, a clip from CNN where the a professor of, uh, of marketing uh, at, at NYU uh, discussed this a little bit and showed how volatile it is in the States. I'd like to share the next part of that clip with you just to get your thoughts on that. Uh, so here it is. Um, yeah, we'll go here. We'll start from here. Quite frankly, we have this coming. Do you think, do you think some colleges realizing this or fearing this is, that's one of the pushes that they want to get kids back on campus because they feel like the longer uh you know it's remote learning or, or online more and more people are going to say what are we paying for 100 percent. just as stock market analysts are looking at companies that have the most cash on their balance sheet we're going to look at universities and the ones that have large tuitions tier two brands and their primary value add was getting your kid out of the house for four years to kind of marinate. When that experience goes away, you're going to see demand destruction like you've never seen. You're going to see the top tier schools go into their waiting list. They'll be fine. They'll clear the waiting list. There's never been a better time to be on a waiting list for a tier one school, which will force the tier two schools to go much deeper into their waiting list. And then the tier three schools, Anderson, are going to reach into their waiting list, which they don't have. Of the 2,800 schools, the median endowment is $7 million, meaning a lot of these schools, if 20 or 30% of the students don't show up, which the surveys say they are planning not to do in fall, we could see 20 to 40% of universities start a death march, similar to what department stores have done. Second, Yeah, so it's a, I guess it's a, uh, it's a bit of a provocative clip, and I appreciate that it's a, the, um, uh, the US is a little different to, uh, to the Australian situation, but... A death march is, uh, is pretty, uh, I thought it was quite striking language. And I'm going to focus this question on the international education sector uh, because it's, it's something that, that well, we, we work in and it's an interesting one. So for over 30 years, we've followed the similar, a similar format, You're using agents, partners, creating pathways, running TNE programs, building online capabilities, etc. And throughout this time, we've seen certain disciplines dominate large students, well, large numbers of students from certain countries. This clip touched on some assumptions that students will always be there, but what if they don't come? I mean, should we as an industry use this time of transition as a catalyst for wholesale change? And how do you do that? Um, I guess, James, I mean, it's, it's a case of, it has to be a catalyst for, for some, some, some modicum of change, right? Whether it's a catalyst for, for, for wholesale change is, is really going to be a function, not of a sector, but on, on, on an institution by institution basis, because I think you have, a, a distribution of exposure to business practices depending on the way in which institutions are run right so you have some institutions which were not particularly exposed or overexposed to any given market or even to a volume of international education as a quantum of the business they do and we've got on the other end of the spectrum we've got some institutions which are facing 
um, I would say a near death march, catastrophic intervention, if this is sustained over 18 to 24 months. So I mean, then, and there's, there's a conditionality about when does it become, when is the patient chronically ill and when is the patient dying, right? And the, the, um, the, the, and the so, and, and with 38 universities and public institutions in, in, in Australia, there is that distribution of, of both risk and impact and disruption. So I, um, I, wholesale, wholesale uh, change to business won't be manifest, but there will be some institutions which will have to make change the way they do this. And if you look through that individual lens, I think it is going to say, well, well, there's a retrospective piece. What were the risk factors I had in terms of the diversification of my business? What were the what were the reliances I had on on certain jurisdictions or certain uh, co countries to be my feeder to underpin my operation? How did I use the revenue that was derived from international students? Did I use it to drive the acquisition of more international students, or was I putting in place a war chest, or was I investing in infrastructure which made me a, a, a more robust organisation and able to weather disruption? And each institution will answer that on, on a different way, on a different, on a different level. But the residual changes from the pandemic are going to be very, they're very time dependent. And um, if, if, as you know right now, I mean, in, in South Australia, uh, we're touch wood, we're COVID free. We've opened up the borders in terms of three of our interstate borders, um, which I find kind of interesting uh, overnight. But, but we are now looking at repatriation um, of, of international students into the state in a measured way and make sure that it's um, done from, from a health and safety perspective. And that starts to send signals towards um, uh, a return to normality, right? So if, if, the, if, the, if the time duration of COVID impact is, is short, we may return to a, an increased normality or, or, or something resembling normality in, in a reasonably short space of time. And, and so the recovery curve will be okay for institutions. There's still a demand for international education. There's still a demand for Australian international education. And there's still a demand for an Australian experience. We can see that we, there's no shortage of applications to our institutions right now to, 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 to study in Australia. What we don't have right now is the means to admit students to our institutions in Australia. And there has to be a bridging piece. And I, I mean, I think ideally we'd be saying to students, look, this is not going to last forever. And this is, this is a point in time piece where it'll either be a, become a manageable situation through, through, through process or it'll be a vaccine, which will make it a manageable condition overall. And, and, and that's the way we'll approach this from a humanities perspective. But in this interim time, start your studies, start your studies online. We've got demonstrated capacity and capability in this space. And your transition from your country to our country will happen in a, in, in, in a managed way at a time when mobilization returns. And I, I, I saw an email the other day where an agent was wondering whether this was the end of globalization. And, and, and you know, it was, I think, through the lens of, of the individual, it, it was having a massive impact on their business. But I, I keep bringing it back to, 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 our, to our group and our viewers. This is a point in time consideration, and it is manageable, and you need contingency to manage it. You need to have, nationally, we do need to have clarity about the ability for students to enroll, get a certificate of enrollment, can begin their studies online and transition over without any deficit or penalty in, in the way in which they would accrue post-study work rights or their, their, their conditions of visa and entry. And that is, that's a political consideration which requires, um, it requires the Department of Home Affairs to just put things in place. I think, to be fair to the government right now, they've been very busy trying to manage the overall impact of, of COVID on the entire economy. And they're working their way through the list of things that they got to try and fix, and that's on the list of things. Yes, it's a yeah, it's a delicate balance, isn't it? Um, I've, I do have a, a an interesting uh, insight. Um, Rob helped me with this one. The in many research centres, international researchers are the engine room, and most of the conversation around international has been related to students, but researchers have been equally impacted and they've been unable to access laboratories and can meet with colleagues in person, and, and many are dependent upon their partner. Uh, oh, sorry, upon the department as their friends and family. And around 48% of these researchers have accompanying family and partners who may be unable to work. So on a limited budget, they're finding it tough as well. So I guess, you know, what, 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 what ways could, could and should a university support an international segment that may be flying under that radar? Yeah, um, and again, it's a, it's a, I, it's, it, there's a sort of a horses for courses answer on that one as well, James. I mean, we made a very conscious decision that we weren't going to close down laboratories. 
in UNESA. So, so we, uh, our cancer research building, which is across the road from where I am right now, that was open the whole time. We put in place social distancing. We, we viewed that. Our, 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 our approach to this one was, you work from home on, uh, it, unless you cannot work from home. And our view was that researchers could not work from home, and uh, well, they could do what they could do from home, but, but their experimental components, the access to laboratories, they needed to come in to be able to do that. So we provided the means for them to do that in a safe way with social distancing, with hygiene measures. So we, we didn't stop. Now, the flip of that one would be, if you look at the Victorian prescription is, do not come to work. So we had a different set of rules in, in different jurisdictions. And so the impact on, on actually our collaboration with some Victorian universities means that some of those projects haven't progressed because there were no researchers on the other end. When you look, look at the impact and on the international cohorts, um, we, we were looking both through a lens of, it was actually about all students, whether they were researchers or, or um, undergrads, postgrads. We put in place a student hardship fund. Um, and it was really a, a, a recognizing that people are engaged in education and in society, and all of a sudden, all of all sense of normality was was removed because um, they there were the imposition of controls on on the way in which you you enacted your life, and a lot of students, whether the postgrads or, or undergrads, were uh, they, they're relying on part time work, and and most of the part time work was in the hospitality industry, and the hospitality industry shut. Right? So so we found very very quickly that students were actually falling into uh, financial hardship. So. We put in place a $10 million fund, um, well, I think it was probably just at the end of March, start of April, we had that up and running. And that's already delivered over $7 million in supports to students on, on, on absolutely rigid criteria of, of, of demonstrated economic hardship. And there's all the food parcels, then there's the help they have around um, accommodation and rent. Um, and the support networks, we put in place a, 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 a mentoring ring around so that students are being checked in on to make sure that they are not socially isolated. All of those things are things you never think you're going to have to do, right? Um, but they, they apply to researchers as much as they do to undergrads. Um, and, 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 and largely, I think in, in, in the makeup of our, our fund, 85, 86% of the total drawdown of funds has been to international students. Wow. So this, it, is, it just shows the impact it has on that, on that cohort. Um, because it, it goes back to that experiential point. They come to Australia to engage in face-to-face -face activities in, um, in their labs or in the classroom, and, and it has been disrupted. They're disconnected from family and they're disconnected from, fam from friends and from peers. And it's a, it, it just creates great stress where they're already investing heavily for advancement purposes. Um, and then suddenly they have this impost put upon them. We put in place um, mechanisms for, for, for uh, if you like, success relative to it, to disadvantage in terms of the way we look at their academic progression. And we had to put in place this financial piece. And it was really sending a signal that, again, this is a temporary thing. This is not, the, your education will continue, but we're going to bridge this. This is one of a bridging intervention, which will help you to get over this um, initial disruption to your life um, without disrupting the business model and activities of the organization as well. Yeah, it was, I, was, um, I was really impressed with what UniSA did. Uh, it was one, I think you're one of the first universities in the country to actually offer the hardship fund. It was, um, well, from what I could see anyway, that was, uh, it was really great to see and then backed up with Study Adelaide's approach as well. So, uh, well, we have, the next question is from Rob, but I'm going to show the clip, Rob, uh, before, you, uh, before you start. This is, uh, this is something that, that relates to Rob's question. The world today is a cacophony of ecosystems colliding in a seemingly chaotic way. Ecosystems that enable collaboration, fostering new innovations and discoveries. Ecosystems that are leading to a self-perpetuating world where ingenuity and creativity engender enterprise and opportunity. A world where the speed of collaboration is becoming even faster. But what happens to the world when education can no longer keep pace with change? And what comes first, innovation or education? Rob, over to you. Thank you. And just before, as a precursor to this, um, I wrote, a, I put that together as a um, video to support a paper. And James, everyone's going to get a copy of that paper's viewing today, won't they? Great. No worries. Yep. Okay. David, the pace of innovation is constantly accelerating, meaning that many fields are redundant almost before students can graduate in those fields. And it's often not helped as well. We want to get new content out. 
there can be protocols, approval processes, etc. And then there's even the challenge of getting people to teach them when they're in narrow fields and they can earn more in industry. And I just think about blockchain as a classic example. A lot of the subject matter can be covered though by intensive courses and micro credentials. Do you believe that the pace of innovation will require institutions to adapt and fast track multiple new layers of education, taking advantage at the same time of such technologies as AR, VR, digital applications, for example? Um, yeah, I guess Rob, um, in answer to the question, the chicken or egg question, education or innovation, I mean, it's, it is a chicken or, a chicken or egg question, right? Um, the, the, the rate of pace of innovation in higher education is, I mean, it's certainly, it's, it's almost exponential, right? And, and the responsiveness that we have to demonstrate to employer and end user needs is, is, is significant. Um, I think there's a fundamental core of professional um, education, which, which is not being hugely disrupted in terms of uh, content, but in terms of the way in which uh, it, it gets you know, translated into, into relevance. So we have to make sure everything is, is, is contemporary. So, so innovating to be contemporary is really important. Um, UniSA in 2016, we kind of said we should probably probably look at, in, at, at online education in, 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 a, in, a, in, a, in a different way. Um, and when we when when I first arrived here in 2013, MOOCs were flavour of the month, and, uh, and, and and MOOCs were going to disrupt universities. In fact, the, the delivery of the MOOC was going to be uh, the death knell for, for, for universities because you could just go online, you could and, and you could watch this video and, and until you were educated. Um, I, I think that that hasn't been shown to be true in the same way. I often view MOOCs as, as just a, just a, a very fancy representation of a book, um, and, and you can read a book and, and it gives you information, but it doesn't necessarily give you education or give you accreditation of that, or give you kind of validation that you know, true assessment that you that you know anything. Right? Um, so I'm very much the role of a university is both text and context, and then validation of of, of the transfer of the knowledge into your head. So. But innovation in the modality of education is is increasingly important because because of demand. Right? Um, I think the, there are a lot of people who want to rescale, upskill. They want to pivot on on, 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 on on how they access information. And some of this goes back to the the, the, fun, the first question that that you and James posed really about the experiential component of education. Different types of people want to learn in different ways. We have people when we started UDSL online, we said let's build. A, a a a product line. Let's build a, a set of degrees which were 100% um, online undergraduate experiences that were built from the bottom up with an with an online pedagogy lens and 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 are different to what would have been, if you like, traditional online education of a PowerPoint slide and a voiceover that was recorded on a scratchy Monday morning. Right? This was this is um, high media content, different types of assessment, remote proctoring. It is geared for to, it's geared for someone who wants to learn online, but it's geared for someone who wants to learn online. And the motivation of the online learner is different to the motivation of the of the face-to-face the -face experiential learner. And they tend to be different age groups. They tend to be in different points in their life. Um, so the disruption of COVID, uh, where everything went online. Meant that a whole cohort of, 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 of people who acquire education, who wanted to acquire it in a certain way, didn't. And that creates greater disruption to them than those who are actually geared to learn and study online. So our, our online um, students are quite happy because they're accessing the, the, the activity that they wanted in the way they wanted, and they're getting several performance that's tailored for them. Mm -hmm. um, we need to be able to deliver that sort of responsive, adaptive product to people based on, on how they want to learn. When we did uh, the first uni jam, and then again when we did the second uni jam, so 2013 and 2015, which were the whole of, whole of institution um, conversations about what we wanted, we, we asked students, how do you want to learn? And we had a perfect pie chart. They wanted face-to-face, -face, online, they wanted exams, they wanted continual assessment. It was almost like a, 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 a trivial pursuit. Uh, <laughs> In terms of the, the 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 equity of distribution of what people wanted, and you can't give everybody everything they want at the same time. So we have to you're phasing it all the time. The piece that the guy see is missing right now is a, a, a modality to deliver short courses which are which are not 
course base, which are not the, 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 to deliver proper micro credits in a way in which the consumer can actually acquire them, uh, combine them, and then parcel them up into a qualification. We still haven't quite cracked that. And it's because, uh, and, and in an Australian context, I think it's because domestic education is not geared for, um, for single course enrollments. It's geared for a programmatic enrollment with, with, with course payment. And you pop out with a degree after three years or four years after you've gone through this thing, or you could do a master's and it has to be 18 months or something. So, but the ability to take a module and a course and actually acquire that skill and be accredited for that skill, the domestic structure is not geared to that. So it doesn't translate them into the international structure as easily. And it can be done, but it's a secondary consideration to the, to, to, to like the overall business and education. I think that's shifting. I think that COVID caused another innovative shift in the, in the construction of short courses, which was a, a, a really a, um, a departmental imperative which came from the minister. He said, you know, I want to get people engaged in programs for six months and out with qualifications. So the AQF, the Australian Qualifications Framework, was, was changed to allow that to happen. And suddenly you can have this engagement exit with an award, which, was, which wasn't structurally enabled before. So if we can get the structural enablement on the qualifications framework sort of thing, I think to, it wouldn't take a, a great innovative leap to change the way in which we do micro credentialing and upskilling. That happens in professional education already, but it doesn't happen. You can't do professional education at a, at a bachelor level right now. I think if we could crack that up, you could provide a myriad of choice to people where they acquire education at the rate they want and have it accredited in a way that they want. And then actually then the university would then translate that into an award that people can recognize. That's really interesting. You know, it seems to be, a, 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 I think there is this sense of, uh, it, it's sort of a messiness around the world of forced online learning because all of a sudden tutors and lecturers have been scrambling to deliver this content online via Zoom courses, often, you know, for the first time. But, you know, necessity does drive innovation. Uh, the quality can be pretty mixed sometimes. And, and we've seen that around the world of students who are, who are not too happy about the way they're experiencing this. But I love your comment about, you know, some of the shifting to, to short online courses may be a way of, of sort of setting the expectation, resetting the expectation uh, that this is what you're going to get at the end of it. Because at the end of the day, it's about student expectation. But I'm curious to know, you know, if you think COVID is, it, is going to affect the rollout of online learning in the longer term, uh, particularly given the commitment with the UniSA and other universities have taken the time, you know, taking the time to build online learning. Is this, how's this going to go? Um, I, I think it will. Uh, I think that um, what, what we've seen right now is that you can, you can take an institution off from, from being face to face to being wholly online in the space of three weeks. Right. And, and nobody ever contemplated that. Three weeks. <laughs> yeah. We went, we went from like, this is when, Lectures, lectures will be online on this date and all lectures will be online by that date. And, and it was that kind of a flip. And we were geared to do that because we had such a strong teaching innovation unit who built an UniSA online program. So they, they really worked exceptionally hard to make sure that, that everybody had the opportunities and, and, and the training and access to facilities to be able to deliver online education in that kind of very, very compressed timeline. Now, when you do online well, and um, I would say that we geared UniSA online to deliver online well, we have student satisfaction level in the high 90s percents, right? So they, 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 I got to, got, that goes back to the desire to learn in that format and being served up what it is you want and what you expect, right? And the, the teacher quality, the, the, the learning resources, the same assessment of, of in, in the 90 percentiles of, of satisfaction. When you flip somebody who's, who's not geared for online education into an online an, um, experience with a, a, a lecturer or, or a prof, or a, tu tu a, a, a tutor who's not geared to deliver an, an acceptable experience. You've got this wonderful Venn diagram of death from an experience. <laughs> Venn diagram of death, I love it. <laughs> where, where you can only have a bad experience, right? And that's only, that's only sustainable for a very short period of time before you're going to get disengagement, you're going to get disillusionment, and you're going to get de -involved. And, and, and that's, that's a terrible outcome for a student. So um, I think with this, experience uh, i think the quality control of uh, the educational product is going to be very front of mind in in uh, deputy vice chancellors academic and provosts across the country to ensure that there is a quality experience for students and um, and and that really it demonstrates 
you, you can flip and, and get to a properly blended model of education where the lecture, all of the pre, um, if you like, the requirement of learning that you need to have to be able to engage in conversation and shoot some webinar and, and shoot webinars in, 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 in seminars or workshops, the lecture could be online if it's done well. Right? And that's almost like setting the scene for what the, the, the context part of the education. The lecture becomes the text, the context becomes the tutes, the workshops, and they can be face-to-face, -face, they can be moderated online, they could be that a mixture of, of you know, there would be nothing to stop us having this setup that we have a panel audience and we have an online participation as well. So you can actually engage with people through, through technology. So I, I do reckon that online learning, the, the, the QA has to go up, and the learnings will be about making sure the students are satisfied so that they're retained and engaged and successful. I think learning analytics in an online environment is even easier to apply. So you can actually track, trace, and, and intervene where students are disengaged or, or are not actually getting the outcomes that they, that they need. And we've spent a lot of time looking at that. And I think that um, it will become more of the norm to have a blended educational experience. So there will be a transitionary, this is just a futurism prediction, right? There's, there's a cohort of students who are going through right now who have who've had a flick to online, which they didn't expect to have. Some of them are having a great time, some of them are miserable. Um, but once we're miserable, as we come out of the COVID piece, we'll return to the, the, the norm of education that they expected and, 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 and what is, what, wanted to experience. But learners who are coming from second level education into tertiary are going to come into a different tertiary experience from day one which will have more online content and so the norm for them is going to be my lectures online my tutors are face to face i've got this book of experiences i go through so their experience is not going to be one of disruption it's going to be the normality that they go into and i think that's a that's a, a very nice way for the institutions to continually improve places to put in place systems for for for, for, for progression but also then to actually offer more content. Yeah, we have, well, one of the poll questions here is, uh, do you think online course delivery will soon be a standard part of how people perceive a higher education experience? The yeah, majority, 47% so far, uh, so the leader is uh, somewhat, yep, so the, our, our audience certainly agrees with you. Uh, we have a few other poll questions here. Uh, please feel free, uh, 118 have, have uh, have submitted their answers, so a little bit to go. Uh, one of the big ones is, do you think there may be a backlog of students wanting to come to Australia and it will result in increased number of international students? Uh, I'd love, I'll, I'll wait till, for later to hear your opinion on this, but 75% uh, think potentially. And, uh, and the, the biggest, uh, ooh, okay, this one's interesting. For the government's pilot program to bring, bring in international students, how concerned are you about the practicalities of quarantine Geez, it's a mix. It's it's thirty four percent are not concerned at all. Forty four percent are somewhat concerned, and twenty two percent are very concerned. So I think that is uh, that's an interesting one. We might touch on that a bit later. Rob, over to you. Yeah, I think um, just on your last points, David. I think uh, what's going to happen is we're going to see conditioning where people step in and step out of education, mm -hmm. and you find people wanting to remain relevant. And I also think that's going to apply to international. We might find that people wanting to upskill, reskill all the time to keep that portfolio going. But anyway. Um, I, on a personal note, I've walked around Campus West many times. It's a wonderful environment you've created there. It's now integrated, it's not disparate, it's got a sense of heart, it's education precinct. It's wonderful. But the expansion of the university's infrastructure around um, that West End was funded with a $300 million that came from your surplus, um, a surplus that may be harder to generate with low numbers of international students, which is the predicted scenario. So. Is this the time to reconsider the future of campus-based learning? And how do you believe universities will appear aesthetically, physically, community-wise a few years from now? Uh, it's a very timely question, Rob. You know, we were about to stick a shovel in the ground and spend another $500 million on infrastructure, um, which is where we were heading for, 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 for this cycle of strategy. Um, because we were an essential service, I, I never stopped coming to work. Uh, so I'd work from home and I'd come in and out and, and it was very, um, unnerving to come into an empty campus right? mm -hmm. and I sat in my office one day thinking to myself we have 1.2 billion dollars worth of infrastructure which is empty and, and yet the business of the institution is not curtailed we're still delivering our teaching and our research and our activities so the built form the, 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 the traditional expectation of the built form is, is just what we think universities are now, there are wholly online universities who have massive enrollments that offer a different experience, right? Now, I don't think 
that, and that's a, that's a, that's a consumer choice piece. That's what somebody wants to engage in. I, I think the majority of certainly Australian parents, we know from, 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 from polling, and, and, and I think a, a lot of international parents um, of school leavers in particular, not necessarily mature age, um, mature age students, but school leavers, want their children to attend university. And by attend, it's almost like that guy said, they want them to come and marinate for a while and soak up the, 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 uh, the environment and then, and then exit with, with, with knowledge which transfers into betterment in terms of the progression as professionals. So the physicality of, of, of education is something which is, which is ingrained as they go from, from kindy to primary to secondary. And that the progression to tertiary in terms of the physicality, the sense of cohort connection, um, and the, 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 the community component of, of, of universities, I think will endure. I think when it, when it comes to the, the great investments that universities are making in, in the replacement of infrastructure it will be along the lines of a changed work environment not necessarily a, a prediction of diminished participation on the campus by the students but certainly um, a component of, of as we just in the last in the last question a component of what we do can readily be delivered online and will be so the physicality for that requirement is reduced in terms of the build form the way in which we've seen our staff move to work from home and then now actually this week, Monday, transition back to the organization in a phased fashion without disruption to business means that increased flexible options for staff to work remotely will mean that you have to have less accommodation in, in, in new facilities. So I think the footprint will get smaller, but I do think there's still going to be a footprint. I still think we'll have really snazzy buildings because snazzy buildings is part of the, the fabric of the university. Um, and there will always be those um, really, if you like, bespoke um, and, and, and innovative learning environments, which 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 are geared for physical interaction with uh, often with technology. So so that you have cohorts who are in and cohorts who are online and engaging with each other. And, with each other. Um, but that build form will, will endure. Um, I just think that when we're sitting down to build like for like replacements, which is largely what the NESA has been doing as we look to consolidate our campuses in the city. Um, we won't have to build as much to replace what we're, what, what, what we're moving. It's an interesting trend of uh, potentially, uh, once you lower that, that, that cost base of delivering education by not having to produce all this expensive infrastructure, then you may be able to, you know, that will allow you, and you know, as you move online, uh, then your gross margin increases and you'll be able to deliver more education to more people and somewhat democratizing the whole experience. But, you know, there, it does strike me that that, isn't really that doesn't suit international students as much as it does local students uh and uh i guess it that that, that leads onto the question about how can you create one platform i guess for students for domestic students who are wanting more online and another platform for international students yeah. who want that entirely on the campus experience how do you how, how do you do that with two distinct audiences um, well, that's actually that was the, one of the parts of the, of the text that I sent Rob a couple of years back. It was about it was about international online education and and recognizing that there are different motivations. So you you, you do have you have um, you've got international students who want to acquire an inter, a, an Australian qualification because they recognize the quality of the institution and the standing of the degree. Right? Now that may or may not necessitate them being in Australia. You can provide that to them. And we've done that with transnational education. We've provided Australian degrees offshore to international students for like generations. UniSA was one of the biggest transnational educators in, in, in the world uh, in, in back probably 10, 15 years ago. That model of provision of, of, of products to somebody who wants to consume them will ensure the, the way in which it gets delivered could be through um, a, a either through partnered offshore translation of what are online uh, activities through third parties or direct transmission of the online activity to the learner. You still have the ones who want to acquire an Australian education in Australia to have the Australian experience. And that's where you need to have the on-campus piece, the face-to-face -face piece, the community piece, and that sense of actually participating in an international education experience mm -hmm. in a diversified uh, classroom where you've got peers from the host country, where you've got that cultural exchange, where you've got the cultural diversity and all of the, the, the wonderful things that come with living in a city like Adelaide and, and exploring a country like Australia. So, and you can tailor for both, you, you can do exactly as you said, you can tailor for both of those demands through different types of product offering, as long as the quality offering is, 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 is actually comparable so that 
the, the education that's provided transnationally or online, the qualification is every bit as robust as the qualification as the face-to-face -face qualification. It's just that the students have had two different experiences in how they're required. I guess that's based on the assumption that the on-campus experience is actually what they expect it to be. And that's, um, and I guess that's probably where uh, there's a few questions uh, around, around what exactly are they going to get in the next two years. Yep. Uh, would you have anything to say about that? Um, I don't think it's going to be a two-year dent. Uh, I, I, that's my own personal feeling. I think that the on-campus experience um, will return to something approaching normal by the end of this year. Well, we can only hope. <laughs> Rob? I, I do think so. I mean, even I mean, like just looking at, at from 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 a from a, a disease management standpoint, this reports out of Oxford that dexamethasone is, is, is reducing mortality in, in ICU. And if we can reduce that, we have a manageable issue, we have a manageable condition, and, and then it becomes it's it, it's no different to flu, really. That's right. And if you didn't catch in the introduction, uh, um, yeah, David Lloyd is actually a a. a uh, what was it? what's your what was your title again? A, a, a specialises in computer aided drug design. So you've got some experience. Yeah. I, I used to work on, 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 on I used to work on something related to text message. It picked up my, my interest, but I'm elapsed. I'm elapsed chemist now. <laughs> I, I must admit, David, I, I'm in answer to some of your points there. I think we might actually see a different shape of cohort next year, and definitely into 2022 when we've got the you know the double double intakes in one sense deferred. Plus, but let's. I, 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 sorry, I, I didn't. I didn't answer about the, 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 the in terms of in terms of the experience that that cohort has versus the composition of the cohort. I think that the on-campus experience will, will return to normality. I think that, I think you're right, Rob. I think the composition of the cohort will be quite different. Yeah. yeah. Can, can I, I avoid this question for you, David? And um, I'm going to put you on the spot a little bit. It's about the elephant in the room, China. I'm conflicted, and I'm sure that most people viewing this webinar are too. Um, we've relied on China for growth over two decades. We've seen it transition into a discretionary consumer market. Families now well placed to make individual choices and not forgetting that education is a very high values based purchase. But we've seen different messages um, emanating from the Chinese government. We've got 39% of Chinese visa holders currently outside of Australia. Um, we have tried to diversify, but the tap just did keep running for a while. How exposed do you believe we are to them and how can we mitigate that risk? Um, I think the exposure is pretty well documented. I think you can look at you can look at national enrollment numbers and you can see that um, because of the relationship we have with China, because of the traditional strong links we've had with China, China has been a strong market component for international education in Australia. And um, you, you, in any market exposure, I mean, you you don't expect to find yourself in a situation where a, a and, and an act of nature, a force majeure, cuts off access of the, to that market, and then it's compounded through, in this case, the geopolitical relations between the two countries, which um, which is outside the control of the universities. So, I mean, on a personal level, I'm, I'm I'm very confident that the links are strong, that the interpersonal relationships are strong, and it, and will, they'll be strong for many years to come. Uh, again, I think that the it, this is a case of weathering two coincident storms from from a market standpoint. Mm -hmm. I know that as COVID was was emerging and seemed to be more of an issue in in Asia than it was in in in, in Australasia, I wrote to many of my peers, uh, uh, presidents in, in Chinese universities, expressing our, our concern for what was happening for them and also our, our willingness to engage with them and, and support them through it in terms of research links and education links. And I, and we got reciprocal letters back as as COVID moved around. And when borders closed, we got the same thing. That there was a desire to retain and 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 not and maintain um, that that level of communication, connection, cooperation, collaboration, and and, and friendship between the two countries. So um, we know now that there's uh, been been directives and, and advice issued around travel and about uh, accessibility and, and 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 choice around determining where you would study in in terms of international education. When I look through a COVID lens. I can't think of anywhere else in the, in, in the world that I'd rather be than, than in, in South Australia right now, uh, in, in, in Adelaide, in, in terms of, of safety, in terms of the way in which it's managed. So when I look at an Australian lens, you would want, as an international student, if you're making a choice for an English bank, an English speaking uh, international experience, I think Australia would, would have to be top your list. Yeah. When then yeah, it yeah. comes to the advisory issues which, are, which may come from the Ministry for Education or about concerns that there are 
uh, racial vilification or safety issues for students on the ground because they're, they're Chinese in Australia. The evidence um, is not manifest for me uh, here in South Australia. Um, if anything, I've seen far more uh, rallying around support of um, Chinese Australians and, and uh, Chinese migrants in our community, our businesses, and trying to, to, to sustain those, those, those friendly relations. Um, so while the market of international education is exposed to China and has been, um, and while it's taken a buffeting through these two pieces, I still think that um, as, as both the disease issues and the pol political issues relax over time, we'll see a return to, not, to, 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 to good relations. Um, I think it's, that goes back to my first point about the, the distribution of impact across the 38 institutions is varies depending on exposure. And some institutions are extremely exposed and some have, have very diverse, again, going back to the trivial pursuit pies of, of distribution, they've got diverse, uh, diverse market inputs. Um, China, for those institutions, is one component of a diversified market and, and, and will be managed, but the relationship will be, made, will be maintained. On the far end of the spectrum, and the union says not in, in that, that pot where there's, there's a, 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 the majority of our students are drawn from one sort of country. If I was in that situation, I'd be looking to try and make sure I, I had very strong links and, and could rehabilitate those, rehabilitate those links as quickly as possible as soon as borders opened. And then there's all the multiple contingencies about entry, visas, mobility, flights, all of that has to come back. But there's no um, immediate evidence of a, 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 a desire or a flight away from Australian education from that market. It's a question of what, um, what brakes are being put on the access to that market, which are largely outside our control. I was gonna ask you about the, uh, um, I mean, obviously the government released this week a plan to, to, to have a pilot program to bring in students. Uh, how concerned are you about the uh, the practicalities of that quarantine? Um, well, it wasn't news to me. I mean, I, I, there was a lot of conversations going on about it before before it popped out. Um, we we're of a view that the the university's job is to educate the students, um, and the, the 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 health and safety of the students themselves and the wider community is, is absolutely paramount. So, South Australia has is advancing this pilot on the back of the strength of a repatriation scheme it did for for Australian citizens um, from. from from India and China a couple of weeks back, where they brought in um, plane loads of, 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 of citizens who, who could have been exposed, who went through a quarantine process, uh, safe hold were involved, uh, the SA Health were involved, uh, they were put up in, in accommodation in, in uh, hotels here in Adelaide, and after two weeks of quarantine, people were tested, and we haven't had a single issue. So that's the, that's the, that's the roadmap by which uh, the, the, this, would, this will be played out. Uh, it has to be done with that rigour, and it has to be done with that level of, of um, I guess, discipline in terms of how this is managed. I think looking at other jurisdictions and looking at where the instances of, of coronavirus have, have reoccurred, um, there is a possibility that we may have a, a, a case in, in these circumstances, but the management of a case is not uh, the catastrophe that, that it might get played out to be. I mean, in terms of it is unrealistic for, for the community to think we are going to have zero cases of coronavirus because it is it is a it's an extant virus in the system right now and it's how we manage cases prevent the cases becoming um contagion and, and distribution and, and, and spread of the virus uh, so that we don't swamp the, the health system but if it's done in, in a proper managed way and if the quarantine is managed appropriately and if all players are, are, are lined up to do their part we'll have a managed transition and again you look at the recovery rates and you know we, we've been again very very fortunate the exposure in in the in, in the in the demographic of of, of age group of, of students you're getting full recovery in, in that call as well so if somebody was unfortunate enough actually to, to have the disease you'd expect to see a recovery for that person and then a trend and, and then zero transmissions after that so i would have concern right but it's not it's not worry Mm. Okay, that's interesting. It's uh, yeah, I think there's going to be. A, a, I mean, I can see right here in the poll. It's, it's the sector uh, is is really split on on how to on how how this is going to go. So I think time will tell. We might move forward a little bit just to just to. Um, I know I'm very cautious of your time. We're almost at the end. I just wanted to talk about some. Uh, well, let's start with this question. But with deferrals and reduced participation, 22% of higher education and 19% of postgraduate research visa holders being located outside of Australia. The, less, the loss of many of these offshore partners 
as they have been forced to close, the impact on family finances, loans, etc. It's a real possibility that the backlog may be building and uh, you know, education values based purchases for both the student and their families, they're, they're, they're bubbling up. And um, you know, do you believe that a year from now that there, there's going to be uh, this, this backlog as well as new commencements, sort of like a build up here? And what, do you, what mechanisms do you have in place to deal with that scenario? I mean, it's a good problem to have, I hope. <laughs> Yeah, uh, coping with demand is, 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 is a good place to be. Um, I think, uh, if I say mental, I think domestically we'll see a counter-cyclic involvement in domestic students. Um, I think that's, that's normally what happens because of the economic contraction in Australia. Students will, will forego their gap year. They, they'll, 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 this is year 12, so they'll, they'll, they'll come to university. So we'll see, we'll see increased demand from the domestic students to participate in, in, in higher education in Australia in the next two to three years. I think we will see a, a, a COVID bubble walk its way through. In, in terms of uh, additional participation. That's interesting. I think, I think international education is not going to be that dissimilar. I think that the, 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 the inaccessibility to any market right now is driving the desire to participate in a market. And the question is whether or not that cohort want to have the face-to-face -face experience or they want to acquire the Australian qualification. Because if it's the latter, well, then international online education is the way in which you can serve and service that demand. And if it is, I want to travel to Australia to have an Australian face-to-face -face experience in an Australian institution. We've got all the bits that have to happen to allow us to, 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 to flourish, but we have capacity to enroll all students. And I think, for, again, from our standpoint as a uni SA, um, our, our composition of, of international to, to, to domestics is about um, 19, 20% international, 80% um, domestic. So there, there is that, that's, a, that's a, a decent distribution of, of, of students. And as the domestic population goes up, I've got capacity to maintain that type of, of, of distribution through growth in the, in the international cohort as well. Um, the infrastructure is built, the online education platform is built. Um, the, the, all we really want to do is welcome students back. So um, it wouldn't cause me great chaos uh, if there was a sudden rush to, to participate in, in higher education in Australia. And I don't think it's, um, I don't think it's, it's something that, that, that the country should be worried about in terms of, in terms of a, 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 uh, a service delivered um, industry because we're talking about something which is two and a half percent of Australian GDP. This is this is the largest single export uh, service industry in the country. In South Australia, it's the largest export industry in, in the state. And um, and it's one that doesn't involve digging up minerals. It, it, it adds value and it creates uh, soft power, it creates linkages, it creates jobs, it creates innovation. It's a very, very worthwhile endeavor. And it is a, a huge employer in, 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 in Australia. So, um, if there is to be a, 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 a demand for international, which I, I think is, is, is quite probable, as long as we are dealing with a, a public health safety appropriately, I don't see why we wouldn't continue to do this. This country has always welcomed international migrants. I'm sitting here, and when I, I started off as an Irish bloke, and now I'm an, I'm, now I'm an Australian Irish bloke. Um, it, the country is built on diversity. And, uh, and I think we shouldn't decide that. <coughs> Rob? Yeah. Um, look, the whole industry is being turned on its head, really. And I think a lot of people have struggled to get, get on top of it. But it will recover, I agree with you. But it's going to be a very different shape, a very different composition. Do you think, and it's just really a, a bit of a leading on from what you're saying there, do you think institutions have the appetite and the capacity to actually live with all of this change and to transition themselves? I, I don't think I have a choice, Rob. Um, I think that, that, that um, you know, the mission, if you look at public institutions, is to deliver, to deliver education um, and, and research. And uh, I guess in terms of, it, it boils down to the way in which they've been managed. And, and, but, but fundamentally, um, universities tend to endure and they tend to, they tend to endure beyond the current management who, who sit in the chair that I'm sitting in right now. I mean, the last organisation I worked in was 399 years older than the one I work in right now. Right? So, so, so it, they, they had the long-term view from a university perspective is actually, it's not decades, it's, it's, it's tens of decades. Um, and I think what we might be experiencing right now is a certain amount of short-termism in, in a young system, which has suddenly found itself in a situation where it was able to do things that it didn't think it was going to be able to do 10, 15, 20 years ago because of the way in which international education changed um, its perspective on business, right? So it'll adjust and it'll get back to what the core business is, to teaching research base on a, on a financially, um, I guess, robust 
basis, which is not about overexposure, which is not about over-reliance or um, about dependence on, on any one given market. And that adjustment has to happen. Um, and so whether institutions have an appetite or not, it's, it, that is going to happen. We had a question here from uh, Chris Hoffman from the Hacker Exchange. I'd love to just get your thoughts on this. He wanted to know what do you feel about the potential hybrid of unis, e.g. UC Berkeley and Google, MIT and Facebook, UniSA and Canva or Apple or something like that. What are your thoughts on big tech coming in? Um, well, I mean, the, one of the first degrees I introduced was a UniSA HP degree. Um, so uh, I, have no, I have no issue with it whatsoever. I, I think partnership is, 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 is key. Um, I think tech companies and the big tech companies, uh, one of the few frontiers that they haven't pushed into in, in a strong way is education. Well, they're not in the business of education. I mean, so it's a question of how do they acquire that, that footing in that. So if they're going to be engaged as private institutions, well, then they're not going to be much different to, to a fee-paying you know, monolith, which is going to deliver some education that people want to access. But there are very, very large, very well-established organizations, the Harvards, Stanfords, the Oxfords and Cambridges of the world, right? Who, who, um, who are very, very strong organizations of brands, which I don't think they will be displaced by a Google or, or an Apple university. It's a different type of offering. Um, but I think partnership with them is, is, is great. The first deal I did um, in, in, in Dublin many, a gazillion years ago when I was in DPCR research, research was with Google because the European headquarters of Google was there. And, and it, was, it brought Gmail in for student uh, email, which is the first place in Europe to do it. So, so working with tech companies to the advantage of the mission to deliver education and research is, is you know, so I think it's powerful, of course. Yeah, and I guess once you do that, you could potentially lower the, lower the cost. Exactly. And double yeah. the capacity. And, you know, it, it could revolutionize the accessibility of universities across. Um, uh, I've got another, well, I'm not sure. Okay, I've got one, one more question before we end up. Uh, Kate Bailey from Urban Nest Queensland. Uh, Okay, uh, have some parts of the university seen online delivery as a potential win? Um, yes, it's a short answer. <laughs> <laughs> the UniSA online guys were really glad that, that they were in UniSA. Yeah, I bet they were. <laughs> they, exactly what they, they I, I can tell you that, that quite literally, they, they, they packed up their, their, their offices and went home and just plugged in and kept doing what they were doing. <laughs> Nothing changed. They were, they, were, they were just in a different place. Um, and then trying to get them back is the trick. <laughs> um, <laughs> So I, I think, uh, yeah, and I, I think a lot of the course coordinators, one of the things that we did, whether it was crazy or not, was we were in the middle of a, of a, a, a university reorganization while COVID happened. So, so we changed our institutional structure on the 6th of April from what was 19 schools and, uh, and a college to seven academic units. So all of that was going on while we were shifting to online, while there was a pandemic and it was, it was a bit of a crazy time. But we created a role called a program dean, and a program dean has a responsibility for, for not only just one area, but a, but a group of areas of programs. They've seen the translation of uh, practice from online across all our programs in a way that they never would have seen before. Right? So the forced uptake has actually changed the appreciation of the value and what it brings to education in a way that you know, any, any, any amount of prescription that we would say that we're going to have 25% of our content online would be 25% of our content, which might be concentrated in, in, in some, some uh, if you like, exponents of, of the value of, higher edu of, of uh, online education and then disregarded by ones who went, well, face-to-face -face is the way to go. Now, everybody's had that, that exposure. They've, they've actually all engaged with the teaching innovation. Needs. So, so I think it's, um, well, I wouldn't go through COVID again just to have them have that experience. It's been a great experience for them to actually have that exposure to online education and, and what it enables them to do. Fascinating answer. Do you have anything to say? Uh, no, just um, this is just an interesting thing. Um, you, uh, little aside, just had um, a goodbye from uh, your uh, old university in Ireland. <laughs> oh, yeah. <laughs> they, they've been tuning in. <laughs> so, Douglas Proctor. Douglas Proctor, yeah. Oh. <laughs> Um, no, I've, I, I think it's been wonderful. I just think it's been, I've, I'm walking away completely um, exhilarated, um, excited about the potential, lovely to see it through a lens which is positive. Um, I thought it was amazing the way you roadmapped in the, in the first day. You created that direction. That's extraordinary ability to respond. And I also think you've, you've highlighted the importance of being agile. Yeah. Uh, come across to me. 
So from a personal perspective, thank you very much, David. I'll, I'll pass you over to James. <laughs> well, I wanted to run through the, uh, the, the final poll results. They're all available now for, for everyone to see. Uh, the second question gets me uh, is, is, is interesting. Do you think if online learning becomes a permanent part of the student experience, universities will have to lower their fees to meet an altered learning experience? 46% said somewhat but it will be marginal. <laughs> uh, you know, there's something in that. I mean, because it is, the, the question is whether you should charge a premium for a for, for, for face-to-face -face experience, right? So maybe we should just put up the on-campus fees and, and, and keep the other ones at, at, at the same level. It's, I think you need to speak to the marketing department again. <laughs> it's, 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 it's the degree, right? And, and as I said, it's how you want to access the degree. And as long as we're providing choice for the pathway to the degree and the qualification on a way that you want to experience the, the, the outcome, which is the acquisition of the qualification and how that enables you to be successful, then that, 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 that is the product. It's, it's whether you go into the supermarket and take it off the shelf or whether you click online and somebody delivers it to the house. Right. right. Professor David Lloyd, thank you very much. You're very welcome, James. It's a pleasure. Cheers, Rob. Bye. Well, the, uh, the, thank you so much for all attending. Uh, I hope you got some real value out of that. I'm certainly, uh, yeah, I, I, I'm, yeah, I'm shaking with, uh, with new, new questions and uh, we'll probably have to get David back at another time, hopefully uh, when there's more semblance of normality. Uh, look, we, we do these uh, regularly and uh, there'll be a survey link sent out after this. All of these are available online at insiderguides.com.au forward slash webinars. Uh, remember, we are Insider Guides. We help international students prepare, support, and we welcome them to, in, to Australia. If any of your international students are having issues in Australia, please send them to insiderguides.com.au. We have a huge range of resources uh, to, to help them uh, through, this, through this time. And we're, we're working uh, hard with all levels of government and states and, and, uh, and, and really just trying to generate the best student experience possible. Uh, Rob? Thank you again for your time. I've enjoyed it thoroughly. See you, everybody. See you. See you next time. Thank you. Thanks. See you guys.